Well, welcome to this lecture on electrical safety in healthcare. And um, I hope you find a little humor in the title here, <clears throat> Healthcare Electrical Safety Inspections. Do we really have to check everything? Yes, well, sort of. It's been an interesting journey <clears throat> in healthcare. Uh, I started out, as some of you may know or remember, as a clinical engineer or a biomedical engineer. It's known by either name. Although biomedical is often more accurate because um, clinical engineers tend to be involved much more in clinical processes and procedures. Um, we tend to be more inside of the space with the nurses and the doctors and such working with them. Whereas biomedical is more of equipment technicians. Not to be confused with biomedical, which has to do with um, I guess, uh, 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 arms and legs and uh, prosthesis and such. However, um, having been a, a biomedical engineer, um, electrical safety inspections was core to not just the job, but it's really essentially what created the biomedical engineering profession many years ago. Um, you know, the safety issues around electrical equipment, particularly in invasive procedures uh, back in the 60s, resulted in a number of electrocutions and deaths and injuries, um, as they found out, due to faulty grounding issues inside equipment. And so you'll find um, most any biomedical engineer um, today and who's been around for a while has a pretty clear understanding of, you know, safety testing, electrical safety inspections, um, you know, ground and leakage and lead testing for devices that have electrodes and pretty familiar with the, uh, you know, the, the recommendations, the requirements, and the ratings for uh, resistance and for for leakage, for electrical leakage. But that being said, um, it's ironic. There's always something to be learned. Um, you know, having worked again in, in clinical engineering all these years and having done thousands upon thousands of inspections, um, in recent years, I discovered some nuances to safety inspections that actually I, I had never, never known. Um, and again, it's kind of a minor nuance, but yet at the same time, it's nuanced nonetheless, but a requirement when you look at NFPA 99. Where it got interesting for me in my career, and this is part of the reason for this lecture, was when I became a facilities uh, director, and I saw that the, um, the maintenance personnel had um, devices that were you know, electrical safety analyzers. But it was very quickly apparent to me in my two facilities, they either didn't know how to use them or they didn't use them. And if they did use them, it was in an extremely limited fashion. Um, because whereas Biomed is driven by preventive maintenance, um, maintenance and facilities is driven by repair. And I think you can almost flip it. I think Biomed probably spent 60% of the time, 70% of the time doing preventive maintenance and 30% of the time doing repairs. And just the opposite when it came to maintenance, they spent probably 60, 70% of the time doing repairs. And actually I, I would say probably 10% of the time, maybe 15 or 20% of the time doing preventive maintenance and the rest of the time for both departments, if you will, there was some time in there for projects. But it was a challenge to get maintenance folks to buy into the need for electrical safety inspections and primarily because the surveyors and the creditors um, never really asked for electrical safety inspections when it came to maintenance folks. In fact, today they, they still really don't ask for electrical safety uh, inspections uh, when they look at maintenance. You know, they're often looking at different things. For example, you know, they're focused much more on, you know, generator testing and life safety inspections for walls and for fire panels and you know they're, they're more the physical environment and more the big major equipment and they're looking more for functionality and such and I think because of that the facilities and maintenance world has sort of slid if you will when it comes to inspections the other thing that's been a challenge when it comes to uh, maintenance uh, when it comes to electrical safety inspections is that often maintenance doesn't necessarily see the equipment they work on as being um, patient care or clinical, whereas of course in biomed, you know, nearly everything they touch is patient care and clinical, and that creates some challenges, especially when um, I've seen obvious contradictions where, if the beds are covered 
in the OR, let's say you have operating room beds or even patient room beds that are covered by um, Biomed, you can bet your bottom dollar there's going to be an electrical safety inspection done on all those pieces of equipment. Same thing with like, you know, uh, blanket warmers or um, maybe even certain kind of operating room lights and such. However, all of a sudden, because it becomes a maintenance responsibility, you, you don't see the electrical safety inspections uh, happening as consistently. And this is, again, another one of those issues, I think, within the maintenance world. And, and I know that the answer predominantly has been over the years, we're just too busy. And it's kind of, um, you know, a waste of, of time or, or it, we don't have time to do it. But that being said as well, enters a, a third conflict when it comes to electrical safety inspections. And that is personal care devices and the revolution and the evolution of you know, uh, low voltage technology such as iPads and cell phones and, you know, all kinds of music devices and computers and personal laptops and such coming into the healthcare arena and healthcare environment. You know, having said this, you know, technically every single device that walks into healthcare, we become responsible for. So from a technical perspective, yes, we are meant to check everything. And that can give you very burdensome especially with, uh, again, personal patient devices. And then, especially when and, especially, and when equipment comes in, again, when it's entry controlled or when it comes into the building, there is nearly, there is a mandate that things are checked when they come into our possession, not necessarily personal care uh, uh, patient uh, devices, but more specifically, definitely when it comes to um, equipment that we purchase for the hospital. So when it comes to in, in initial inspection, Everything that's electrical is meant to have an electrical safety inspection. Um, minimally, a physical inspection. And now, when I say physical inspection, one of the challenges, again, because the evolution revolution of design and technologies is something called double insulation. We have equipment out there now, uh, lots of it, that it has no metal, if you will, external part of the device that you can touch. It is completely enshrouded in a non-conductive case, typically plastic, and it's double insulated. In other words, there's, there's, there's an extra wall in there built where you cannot get to a metal part. So even if there's an internal short in the device, it's not going to pass a current externally. And then, of course, you get into the difference between three-prong plugs and two-prong plugs, things with grounds, things without grounds. And these conversations go on and on. You know, what needs to have a, 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 plug, a third ground uh, and what can have two uh, prongs? in a patient care environment. I think to the rescue for most of us after the initial inspection is the risk assessment. And also clearly understanding the definition of patient care environment, um, if you will, the uh, clinical environment, and then the non-clinical environment. And those really are the tools we have to really just nail. You know, we have to understand when we have a piece of equipment in an office that essentially is a business function, you know, like electrical stapler or maybe like a paper shredder or things like that. You know, we're, we, we don't have to test those things because we may have done the initial inspection. But beyond that, like anything else, it's in a non-clinical area. The patients or the users, uh, I mean, the, the users, which are the employees typically, they can evaluate a device for it, you know. Uh, not be not needing to be tested or when it's failed or when there's a great core or something like that. And we can create a policy and a risk assessment around that. However, when we get into the clinical environment, not the patient environment, but the clinical environment, where we have staff and we have, let's say, like laboratory or radiology or maybe it's a nurse's station or something like that, that shifts things a little bit for us. And we have to, again, do a risk assessment and make determinations what can and cannot be excluded from our ongoing scheduled inspections. And by and large, technically, we're meant to inspect nearly everything in that environment with few exceptions, particularly a physical inspection. I know that when we have done discussion boards, people have talked about like the kitchen, for example. You know, there's lots of little appliances in kitchens that never get inspected. You know, it could be a mixer, a blender, or a microwave, uh, something like that but it gets moved around and plugged in and unplugged and plugged in and unplugged all the time. And something like that can become a hazard, both a fire hazard as well as electrocution hazard, 
um, you know, over time. And they really should be inspected. Now, again, I would say that probably you could come up with some way of maybe having the department do some inspection, although there's, that's not the core responsibility. There's too many users, and by and large, they're just not going to do it. And kind of along the same lines, you have environmental services. Environmental services is one of those departments that uses electricity all over the hospital. And they don't just use electricity. They will unplug and plug things in multiple times a day on one shift. And they really do damage a lot of our outlets and they damage a lot of their plugs, you know, by the way that they do or don't pull those plugs. I mean, there's no doubt, you know, that having plugs located within just a, a foot and a half or so from the floor um, adds to, you know, um, the, the issue, you know, as folks won't bend over and pull on the thick insulation part of the cords. And really, that's one of the emphasis I want to make with this particular lecture with you is that, you know, we need to do risk assessments and people like environmental services, we probably ought to do extra training with those folks because it, you know, they, they do cause a lot of maintenance issues and potentially safety issues. And, and we all know that not all people coming into those departments are necessarily really thinking about the implications of pulling on a cord, you know, that's, uh, you know, 20, 30 feet away to get to unplug so they can, they can hurry up and, you know, go to the next job and, and do the next, you know, vacuuming or the next scrubbing or whatever they're going to do. So, you know, really, I, 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 I'm sure that um, when you work in healthcare and, and you work with like an environmental services department, you're going to find that, you know, again, like vacuum cleaners and things like that, they don't always get inspected on a regular basis. This is an area where we have a lot of room to improve. Um, you know, we need to have better inventories. We need to have better risk assessments and we need to have better better checks so really you know at some point someone's going to start paying much much closer attention to this particularly in the facility side again i would say gander the say most maintenance um 